There's a place I have found in the shade on the ground, far from all worries and troubling sound. When I go there to be by myself, only me. No one can guess what I came there to see. There's a sun in the sky. There's a cloud drifting by. All kinds of birds make you wish you could fly. And in the distance, I see someone waving at me. I hope that it's you, but who else could it be? Hey, welcome to Untold Radio Network Coffee Time. It is Monday morning, depending on where you are. It's Monday midday out on the East Coast. Here in the Central Time Zone, it is 1030. Um, got my guest today is our host, uh, one of the network hosts here, um, Brian King Sharp from Weird Encounters. How are you, Brian? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm hanging in there. How was your weekend? Very busy, man. Very busy. Yeah. <laughs> Weekends all kind of run into the to the week when you work from home and you work for yourself. It's yeah. I, I work harder for myself than I have for anybody else in the world. So you know, when I when I started uh my own real estate firm, I thought, man, this will be nice. You're not tied to have to go in at a certain time every morning. I, I've never felt like I was busier in my life than the first few years of doing that. Um, and you hear that a lot, don't you? I, yeah, I remember it's like when, for everybody, you know. I remember when my dad retired. He he moved down to Arizona. Him, and my mom bought a little place down in a down by Mesa, and he built a Four Seasons room onto this little place they bought. And everybody saw that he was a retired contractor, and all became friends with him. And then they were all hiring him. Would you build one of those for us? He after like six months, he told me, I've never been so freaking busy in my life than when I retired, man. <laughs> yeah, I used to I used to hate getting up at 4 30 in the morning to go to my retail management job that I couldn't stand. And now I find myself waking up at 3, 3 30 in the morning and I'm ready to go to work. And I can't stop thinking about what I need to be editing or what I need to be doing for this guest that's coming up. So but it's something I love to do, man. It's the best thing I've ever done in my life. Well, that's why I titled this morning's show Going Full Time, because that's what's happened with this for you. I mean, you've for I mean, a lot of people in our chat know who you are, but let's start from square one. I mean, it, you, when when you started an adult career, uh, it, you know, as an adult, um, you didn't start out obviously producing podcasts in the in the Sasquatch community I mean, where how, where did it start and how did it get to here you know yeah when I, I I worked I was one of those working kids I was a latchkey kid growing up and I started working as soon as I could you know you had to get in Georgia I don't know where it is how it is for everybody else but you had to get a work permit I started working at like 14 and a half officially and I think my first job was at McDonald's so I started doing that. And I, I, when I got out of high school, I went into retail management. I was running convenience stores and restaurants and things like that when I was 18. And then eventually when I really became an adult, like my early thirties, I, I started in law enforcement. So I did that for 16 years and I left that in 2016 and we bought about 40 acres of property here in North Carolina. And I moved up here and continued the retail thing. You know, I started working for a big retail parts store. And that's what I was doing up until, gosh, I guess it was March of last year is when I left and started doing this full time. I started the show, I started Sasquatch Odyssey back in 2021. I think the first episode was like February the 7th as I posted the, the show. And like everybody's podcast, there was about 12 people listening. And I think four of those were probably my friends and family. So, you know, I just kept, plugging away, posting shows, interviewing people, and it just started to grow, you know, and I got to a point where it was one or the other. I needed to take a leap of faith and leave the retail job that I couldn't stand. And it was really killing me. I was working 50 plus hours a week, driving two hours a day round trip to get to and from work. And I just wasn't happy. So I made the decision back in 
March of last year to say, you know what, I'm going to give this podcasting thing a, a full go, good college try, and it's worked out. So I'm glad I made the leap. Nice. So with, uh, you know, you've got the um, the show here on the network with Weird Encounters, but um, you've kind of branched off to where now it's not just the Sasquatch platform. You're kind of spinning it off with a, a paranormal uh, venue for people to be able to share encounters and stories too now, right? Yeah, one of the things that, that happened during the beginning and the birth of the Sasquatch Odyssey was I was having these conversations with people about Sasquatch and it would turn into, well, there was this time where I saw a UFO or I also saw a Chupacabra or I also had this encounter. I saw a dog. And so I created the Paranormal Odyssey podcast and I hosted that for, I don't know, a little over a year or so. And when I started the True Crime Odyssey podcast, so then I had three shows and I'm thinking, well, this is kind of a studio. This is a, a network of shows. So I need to create something to have everything under one umbrella. So we started the paranormal world production studio and I'm thankful that I was able to find a host to sort of take over the paranormal odyssey thing. And I've got Wayne on board and he's been hosting that show since I think October or November of last year. Yeah. I watched it the other night. He does a great job. Yeah. Super great guy. He was doing a podcast for Manimal Research, his his research organization for about a couple of years. And he is already familiar with the podcasting thing. So when I handed off the reins, he's picked it up and he's grown the show. It's doing fantastic. So if you guys haven't listened to Paranormal Odyssey, it's got a YouTube channel here and you can follow it. Find it anywhere you get your podcast. So, but I'm still interested in the paranormal stuff. The problem with that is, is most Sasquatch people are purists, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> They want to talk about Bigfoot and they don't want to talk about aliens and all the other weird things that happen to people. So weird encounters came up with, you know, Doug approached me and asked me if I'd be interested in maybe doing a show on the network. And that was a great op opportunity for me to dive back into some of those things that interest me that the folks that listen to Sasquatch Odyssey may not necessarily want to do. So weird encounters is just what it says. It's a, it's a little bit of everything. Sometimes yeah, I a little, little bit bigger shoebox to exist in you can you, what you see subject matter one week might differ the following week so absolutely you might see a interview with les stroud survivor man one week and the next week i'm talking about alien abductions and somebody flying an alien ship as a pilot sure. so all kinds of different things for everybody interesting so normally what we do on this show one of the things we do uh is talk a little bit about what was going on at the network last week so um i Got a few notes here I'll try to refer to. Um, last night, the Bigfoot influencers, Tim and Dana, had uh, had actually had Doug on uh, talking about Legend Meets Science 2. And, you know, that's it's. I get asked this all the time. Dude, when's Legend Meets Science 2 coming out? And it's, it's one of those deals that the whole COVID thing really threw a screwball to this because um, – on, on a lot of different levels, because not only was it hard to get into, you know, first of all, you're talking about a documentary that's covering a ton of different things. It's not just a storyline that starts at the beginning and follows through. One section of it is a gentleman who is one of the only human beings, I mean, maybe the only one that can produce infrasound, okay? Um and they put a camera down his throat and they look at, how do you do this? You know, what, what's it, what's it sound like? And um, so they talk about that. And then the next, uh, the next deal is about it. You know, it's just a lot of different interesting sections. Um, so you've got the production ability to do that because you're not showing up with one film crew. It's one month you're working with one film crew. The next month you got a different crew in a different location and you're trying to piece together all these puzzle pieces that's going to create this awesome picture. But trying to do that, travel, get it all lined up throughout the COVID deal, I mean, that put a year of the production of this really almost at a standstill. And then also a big part of, um, a big part of the show was going to be a lot of lab work a lot of lab work that was going to be headed up by Darby Orcutt, who was kind of the, the, what would be the best, the coordinator 
that's got that's got different labs, different a, a large team of different people um, that were going to be testing hair samples, uh, skin oil samples, different things that those labs weren't able to keep doing what they were doing. I mean, if you look at where the whole and I hate talking about COVID as a subject, but where that started and how, where it progressed that first year. I mean, it started with this whole, what is it? How big is it? Does it, what all does it affect? Is it just humans? This and that after a year, you've got zoos that have a lion dying and they test it and it's got COVID in, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota here, my hometown, they had, uh, a lion and a, it was a mountain lion, I believe, and a lynx both died within three days of each other. Both of them tested positive for COVID. So now you've got all these universities, colleges being given grants to research. Is this a virus that can be transferred amongst animals? Is it going to affect a livestock population and our food supply and things like this? Nobody really had an idea of how, what does this look like? And so all these labs became busy testing these different things and they still are. So pretty much anything that you had designed to where it wasn't being funded with a government grant, but you're coming in to write a check and do work in a lab was absolutely thrown on a back burner. You couldn't find a lab to do anything, let alone one that was willing to do what Doug and, them were asking it to do so um it really delayed the process of legend meat science and this, so doug talked about that quite a bit on uh on the bigfoot influencers uh talking weird dr dean yesterday had um and i gotta make sure i'm saying his name right it's aaron uh i don't know if it was mertez or mertz or but the Bigfoot Trap, he is a filmmaker based out of Nashville. And um, they talked a little bit about some of his film work, uh, some of the projects he's got coming up. It was an interesting discussion. Um, I enjoyed it. I mean, it wasn't really based on one topic. It was really more about all the subject matter that was covered in different films, different documentaries. But uh, then Saturday night, Down South Anomalies head on – Carter uh, Boucher, who is a field investigator. Um, last Wednesday, really interesting show, Doug and Alex on Untold Radio, the flagship show of the network, had Scott M. on. And Scott M. is the owner of the cabin that was being built uh, in um, Alex Petikoff and Seth Breedlove's show Alaskan Intercoastal Sasquatch part one and part two and you know kind of to protect him they they the, his anonymity to some extent I mean those who know him know him but they put Scott M on they don't just throw his last name around and stuff but it was interesting to, to kind of hear the conversation from him that if you saw those the, the, that two-part documentary series from uh, Mountain Beast Mysteries. It really was intriguing to hear this con this conversation with him and hear the different. Vo they played a lot of vocals on there. Talked about uh, his experiences that maybe weren't covered on the documentary. So that was interesting. I would encourage people to check that out if they missed it. Um, and then on Mysterious Library. Uh, Jason McLean and uh, Dr. Dean had Stephen Greer's on, who um, has a recent documentary they put out called Cosmic Host, or I'm sorry, Cosmic Hoax. And that was interesting. Uh, that was an int I haven't watched the documentary yet. I'd never heard of this documentary, but after hearing the show, now I'm kind of excited to see it. So I'm looking forward to that. Tonight on Pine Island Research, I have Chuck Morgan, who a lot of us see in our chats as Howling Underdog Films. He's going to come on and talk a little bit about uh, a project, a documentary that he's got coming up that's going to be released soon. 
and really, you know, he didn't, he's not some, he's done a documentary in the past that got a lot of views online, but he's not somebody who's always 12 hours a day, 365 days a year working on documentaries. You know, this was kind of started out as a hobby for him. And it's kind of interesting, I think, to talk to a researcher and documentary maker that's not funded by it. And, you know, he walks into a room at a Sasquatch convention, probably nobody's going to know who he is, you know? So it'll be interesting to hear about that. We're going to share some uh, promo video he's got on his upcoming documentary and, and talk to him a little bit about the area and some of the things that are going to be in it. So what do you got coming up on your horizon? Does weird encounters have a show coming up? Yeah, I think maybe this Friday. I'm not really sure what it's going to be out this Friday, to be honest. It's only Monday, so I, I don't usually think a, more than a couple of days ahead. But I, I, I'm the same way. If you ask me on Thursday who my guest is Monday, there's a it's a coin toss that I'll know yet. But I've had a lot of great conversations recently. Maybe one that might show up. I've actually got scheduled at two o'clock today. For those in the UFO field are probably familiar with Daryl Sims. He's a former CIA agent, former military police officer, and he's now known as the alien hunter. So I think he has the biggest collection of alien, supposed alien implants of anybody on the planet. So I'm really wow. looking forward to that. He's going to be at a it's a conference coming up here in North Carolina that I'll be at. I'll actually be emceeing that conference next year, but I'll be there as a vendor this year up in Hamlet, North Carolina. And he, Ron Moorhead and uh, Scott Nelson, the crypto linguist who mm -hmm. famously took a look at the Sierra sounds. I've got Scott scheduled to come on the show here in the next couple of weeks. So Scott's a tons great of, guest. yeah, tons of stuff coming up. I had a really interesting conversation recently, a couple of days ago with three guys from the Irish Bigfoot research organization and really had some interesting conversations with those guys so that that'll eventually make its way onto weird encounters too had a great conversation recently with cliff barackman so that'll make it over on weird encounters and alex petikoff who you mentioned earlier from small town monsters yeah. and on the trail of bigfoot so tons of stuff coming up man cool it'll be interesting to see these irish guys too i uh Friend of mine, uh, somebody that a lot of the people in our chat knows, um, Derek McManus is from Ireland, and we always tease him. There's no Bigfoot in Ireland, man. But, you know, Ireland really is kind of an interesting place, There's, especially when it just comes to the paranormal. Um, but, I, you know, you kind of look at this geographically, and you say, how? You know, but... I'm always intrigued by the discussion. So if there's a, if somebody thinks they have an answer to the how question, I'm ready to listen. So well, these guys, these guys definitely don't have an answer, but you know, I've had people on the show in the past on Sasquatch Odyssey, particularly, you know, I've had Deborah Hatswell on and she had an encounter when she was a child over in the UK, right? She's yeah. so I, I too, like you look at the geographical makeup of whatever the area happens to be, but if these things have been there for tons of years and they claim there's tons of places that they can hide and they're finding tracks, they're, you know, recording vocalizations, wood knocks, and they've had a couple of sightings. You know, I had, it was Jim, Chris, and Ron and all, well, two out of the three had claimed to have a physical encounter where they saw these things. So there's definitely something there. There's a there there. I just don't know what it is. Yeah. Well, you know, my research of Sasquatch is always coming from a flesh and blood standpoint, which I look at it as a subject that uh, may or may not have supernatural capability. I until my research shows it does, I really don't follow that path when I when I look at data until I see data that would say maybe the pl most plausible explanation is something other than a natural explanation and. I haven't seen that yet, but I'm certainly open-minded to that conversation. For those who do believe there is a supernatural aspect to it, there really isn't a question of how. I mean, if that was the case, it could be anywhere. So, um, Well, here's the know, way I look at that, Jeff. I, I had Carter Bouchard. You mentioned Carter earlier as a guest on yeah. one of the shows. I've had Carter on my show three times now. He's got three books out, Sasquatch Evidence of Enigma, one, two, and three. He's very original with his titles. Mm -hmm. But the part of the, the niche thing for Carter is 
these outlandish and really out there encounter stories that people are having with Sasquatch to the point of tons of mind speak. These things are showing up. They're touching people through walls. They're, there's all kinds of different components to it, right? And mm-hmm. I've caught a lot of crap for having him on my show because people are like, this guy's oh, he's full of crap. He's making these stories up just to sell books. And I know Carter, and he vets these people. He goes out and talks to them face-to-face. And I posted a photograph that he had sent me, and he's like, look, dude, th- I can already tell you, if you post this on your social media, people are going to be on one side of the fence or the other. There's no in-between. It was a person who had had activity on the property, and he went out and talked to them. And this guy, these guys are hunters. They don't live there full time. There's a couple of like shacks and cabins and things. And they're claiming to have all this activity. And they set up a trail camera. And he famously posted this after his book came out. There's a picture of this guy walking towards the trail cam. And then four seconds later, there's this hand in the frame. It's a still photograph of what looks like a gorilla hand or something like that. So I've posted that up and people have just went berserk about it. You know, it's either, oh my God, that's crazy. Or somebody said, it looks like a 1970s costume from Halloween that I remember from a kid, you know, Mm -hmm. all these different things. But I said all that to say, Carter is a very, he's very much a believer in the supernatural or the not so flesh and blood aspect to these Sasquatch. He's had encounters himself where these things have been walking on thermal and it in the middle of a, like a logging road and it just disappears, like literally disappears. So, you know, I'm, I'm like you, if these things exist at all, I think they are flesh and blood, right? I still need convincing. I'm not like you. I haven't had a sighting. I haven't had an encounter. So I'm 50, 50, but I say if they are, it's probably some sort of relic hominoid, maybe even an hominin of some sort. Sure. But you know, we've been doing this for 50 plus years, and this has sort of been a theme for me over the course of the last five or six months. We've been doing the same thing over and over again for 50 plus years. I, I like to use that number. 50 sounds good, right? But it's been a lot longer than that, that Sasquatch has been on people's radar and people have really been looking at them. But we haven't gotten any closer to the to the goal line, in my Absolutely. opinion, since the Patterson-Gimlin film put us on the five-yard line. And we're still there. So absolutely, we have to start looking outside the box a bit. And I'm not saying go, I'm not saying I go absolutely buck wild here and say the aliens are dropping them off. That's why we can't find a body. But I think we need to open our minds to the possibility there may be more to this than than what we really know. Well, I mean, if you're going to look at it from a on paper nuts and bolts perspective, if we're talking about a flesh and blood creature here, it feels like we should be further than the five yard line in the last 60 some years, you know? Um, But like I say, I mean, now here's the thing in my research and in my experience uh, trying to push a ball further down the road when it comes to Sasquatch, it, I have seen evidence. uh, I've seen enough data to believe that, there are there is a real phenomena to the paranormal. I just don't know how it would relate to Bigfoot. You know, people say, "Well, look, man, you 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 know how many reports are out there of people saw Bigfoot and there were orbs around it." It's like, do you know how many reports are of people who saw Bigfoot with no orbs? That's probably you know ten to one. And how many reports are of people who saw orbs, but there was no Bigfoot? That's probably 50 to 1. So, I mean, you know, jokingly, I've said for over a year now until I see Bigfoot fart out an orb. I don't know how that there would be the where that connection is. But I, I've seen enough on the raw cam data of the nine cams that Doug has on Randy's property to believe that orbs are a real thing. I've seen over and over stuff that cannot be naturally explained. And a lot of it was naturally explained. I've seen clip after clip after clip where we say it's volcanic ash. It's a, it's some something the uh, the forest fires that were up in Canada were, were pushing ash down and the way that it would float and catch light. You could eventually deduce that that is probably a plausible explanation of what you're seeing there. But then all of a sudden you see a clip and you're like, dude, there is no natural explanation of what that is. There just isn't. And, you know, uh, 
So when it comes to the, the supernatural or the paranormal, I believe that exists on a lot of different levels as far as how it exists intact or joined to the Bigfoot discussion i have no clue so until until then i have to approach bigfoot from a flesh and blood perspective but i'm certainly open to the discussion and i love hearing people talk about how they believe problem is most of the people who talk about it brian don't tie in their reasoning for that belief i mean they'll say oh i think bigfoot can do this or he can do that why why do you feel that way well that's the end of the discussion and, you know, from a research perspective, I need the discussion a little bit further than that. And I think Carter tries to do that. I mean, when he talks about the supernatural aspect and, and talks about Sasquatch, he doesn't just say, well, they can do this, they can do that, presenting this stuff as a matter of fact, and that's all you hear. He actually tries to go and explain, this is why I feel that way. So, um uh, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for somebody that will at least state their state their reasoning as to why they believe something, you know. Yeah, this came up when I was having the conversation with, and you guys will see it when this is posted over here on Weird Encounters, with Cliff Brackman. I mean, Cliff is very anti-woo. He's very flesh and blood. He's very scientific in his approach to this. And I asked him, you know, they get a lot of reports up at the NABC. And I said, are you guys getting these reports like I am on my show, you know, 300 episodes in on the Sasquatch Odyssey podcast, I get probably 25%, maybe a little less of those involve something else. Maybe, maybe it's before, maybe it's after, maybe these people are experiencing something in another part of their life outside of the woods, but there's some sort of paranormal thing going on, whether it be orbs or lights or other things that they're seeing with Bigfoot. And he said, no, less than 10%. So he literally, he'll he'll write it down. It's data, but mm -hmm. he basically throws those out because of the such a low percentage. When you look at the totality of how many anecdotal encounters are documented every single year in this country, and I get that, you know, scientifically, you gotta you gotta look at the data, and if it's less than ten percent, you go, eh, you know, it may be something, but there may not be a there there at all. Yeah, you know, part of when I look at. Um, you know, the BFRO and the report system, it, it's probably the most referred to resource uh, when it comes to encounters. It's been in place for a long time. It hasn't changed much since it went into place. I mean, you've got some great investigators that are involved, hundreds of them, uh, geographically spread all over that look into this. Now, the list of questions that they'll ask the interview, you know, investigator one, investigator two, their interview styles are different. You know, how comfortable somebody is telling somebody like that about a detail of their uh, experience may not exist with one person as it does with another. When people are asked about or being interviewed by a BFRO investigator, it doesn't feel like the right arena to talk about, oh, and let me tell you something else about this experience. And it has a supernatural aspect to it. They might feel compelled to not mention those things. So, you know, if part of that investigative process was to say, now this may or may not be the case, but can I ask you, was there anything other than not understanding or not knowing what it was you were looking at at first? And you may have you know, an opinion on what it was now in retrospect, but was there any supernatural aspect or any aspect of this that didn't seem to have a natural explanation? Did it move in a way? Was there sounds that you were hearing? Was there lights and what, 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 anything like that? It, it's, it, you might be surprised at how many of them thousands of encounters at that point are going to feel comfortable to tell you something that maybe most of us just assume wasn't there. And so that's not me advocating that, that there's a supernatural side to it. It's just I understand the, the, the atmosphere in which those, um, those uh, interviews and investigations are done. They're done from exactly the way I approach my research, from a flesh and blood perspective. So, And there are things that probably need to change with that. I don't, I don't like the fact that there's just class A and class B encounters. It seems to me that there's like five steps in between those that should exist, you know, 
the guy who sees one from 250 yards away cross a road for three seconds and somebody who's had an experience like me or Joe Snyder or Jay Fritz, that's completely different. They're both just class A encounters, you know. <laughs> so I think it is a little bit uh, – I think it could go further into being useful, being resourceful to have a, a, B, C, D, maybe level of grading what happened in these experiences. But I agree. And that's one of the things I, I said to Cliff, he said, you know, a lot of people will say, well, they don't tell you that other aspect of their sighting because they're afraid you're, they know you're a flesh and blood kind of guy. You're not going to listen to that. So they're not comfortable telling you he doesn't really buy into that, but I do that on my show. At least I try to make people feel comfortable enough to share everything and know that they're not going to be treated like they're crazy. So maybe that's why I'm seeing maybe 20, 25% of the things that I'm documenting versus he's getting a 10% return on that kind of stuff. It may just be the simple, approach to how the interview is conducted. I don't know. I'm not saying one's better than the other or whatnot. There's a lot of people saying hello in the chat, but I can't really respond on my end. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're saying hello to me. I'm not ignoring you guys. I just don't have the ability to type out and say hello. So, Well, we've got so many people that listen to the show on podcasts that it's hard for me. I, I want to ask questions. If anybody's got a question in chat, put it in all caps. We'll get it up. But you know, even going in and doing the roll call anymore. I never really thought of it from that perspective, but we've got about 10 times the listenership on the various podcast platforms than we do in views on YouTube. And Doug said, you know, if somebody's driving to work, they're not going to listen to you for 10 minutes. Welcome everybody by name to the show. They're going to turn the channel. And I thought, you know, I never really thought of that before. So <laughs> it, it makes sense. But yeah, I I love the interactive aspect of the chat being part of the questions. And they, they typically do add a lot to a show by offering questions and opinions that we can pull up and, and, and involve in the conversation. So I did that yeah. recently. I had Ron Moorhead back on the show for the second time and I had Cliff, our conversation with Cliff. I literally did that for my listeners on Sasquatch Odyssey. I reached out and said, Hey. What do you guys want to know from them? I can ask questions all day, but it's it's sort of the opposite of the live chat, but because it's pre-recorded. Sure. But people submitted tons of great questions, and it was a fantastic time with both of them because it was things I'd probably not have asked myself because I would have probably stuck to the middle of the road and just done the the regular podcast thing. And people had some really great great questions. So, yeah. Well, getting back to the whole you know interview style and the way. You know, one of the things, and you've probably, you've probably come to realize this because, you know, one of the first places I ever shared my encounter was with you and on your show. And um, you have a lot of conversations with people. You get an email, you call them, you talk to them, kind of try to figure out, are we dealing with a sane individual, which may have been hard the first time you talked to me, but, um, <laughs> you know, you figure out where you're at, take that temperature schedule a time, record the show. And um, one of the things that I've noticed, and I've talked about this in the past on Pine Island Research is, you know, if I was to, I'm part of a network of a bunch of different hunting guides. I grew up, you know, in a family that that's what we did is we, a lot of big game hunting all over the Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, the Dakotas, Minnesota, all over the place. But we there was a lot of different guides that we re referred people to, and they referred people to us, depending on what you want to go hunting for. And I mean, over a hundred. And um, a couple of years ago, I was starting to talk to some of these guys, and every time I had a chance in person, trying to figure out if they've ever had an experience out there. I mean, these guys spend, you know, seventy to a hundred days a year, really off grid. I mean we're not talking five minutes from a convenience store off grid. We're talking like five day horseback ride into nowhere, you know? And um, there was a way when you start that conversation, it, it really made a difference in the comfortability. Somebody had to talk to you and share something. If you said, Hey, have you ever seen anything like a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch? You weren't going to get anything back. 
if I start that conversation and say, you know, I, I'm kind of curious. I, I look back at my experience in these remote places, and I'm just kind of curious. Have you ever had an experience that you couldn't explain from a natural, plausible explanation that the things that you've seen or heard that continue to this day not make any sense as to what that was? And you ask it like that, and you'd be surprised at how many people will come out and start talking. And they might, it's more than Bigfoot. They'll talk about lights and this and that and whatever. But setting that opportunity to have a conversation up like that is way more effective than just walking into a cafe or a bait shop and say, Raise your hand if you've ever seen Bigfoot. Nobody's going to do it. Um, and I, I kind of feel like. If we can agree that that's true, then the the personality, the approach, the style of anybody that's investigating anything when it comes to talking to a person who's had an experience is going to be different every time. What that person's comfortable sharing, even if they say, I'll tell you what happened, there's a lot they might not tell you if it's just not set up correctly. Um but you've had, I, I would imagine you've experienced that when you're talking to all these people that have shared their encounters with you. Yeah. And there's some that don't end up on the show. You know, there's people that are just not comfortable doing that. And I've given my time and even recorded them and, you know, with their permission, obviously. And it just doesn't ever make it on the show because, you know, they break down. Some people, there's one guy that I talked to in Georgia. I tried to talk to him three or four times. This has been a couple of years back. I never got his full story. I still don't know what his full story is because he literally could not recount it to me on the phone. And there's, there's a ton of people out there that are like that. So I've, I've experienced all aspects of that, trying to do these interviews and bring them on the show. So I definitely get it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I want to start doing with the different hosts that we have on here on coffee time is give people an opportunity to get to know the different hosts or the people that we have on here, maybe from a different way that they feel they know you. I mean, a Brian King Sharp, what do you know of Brian King Sharp? Well, it's basically what I know about Brian King is what you would probably read in a two paragraph bio on the back of a book you'd write. You know, I mean, it's pretty nuts and bolts. So, um, thought we'd break this down a little bit. Um, I've got a list of questions I'm gonna ask you that are kind of off the wall, but they're fun. None of them are going to – I don't think you have to play the I'll pass on that one uh, card on any of them. None of them are too too hard. But uh, the three most listened to songs on your playlist, what would they be? Wow. I would definitely say probably something Garth Brooks, maybe Wolves. That's one of my favorite songs. Most people mm -hmm. probably never heard it. I started singing when I was old enough to talk, and the first – talent show I ever won was singing the song Garth Brooks song wolves. Wow. So that I'd say red dirt road probably would be second in that Brooks and Dunn. If you're Brooks and Gun Brooks and Dunn fans and anything, Steve Miller band, you know, the oh, Joe yeah. Crew, jet airliner. I was, oh, I was, was a kid. I was born in 74 and I grew up, you know, riding around in my dad's 77 Camaro with a eight track player and listening to the Steve Miller band. So, Nice. Yeah. I, th the one thing about the Steve Miller band is, it, you know, there's a lot of bands out there that you'll say, well, I like this song and that song, but I don't like that one. Don't like, if you like the Steve Miller band, you pretty much like everything they ever did. Cause it's kind of has that same flavor, you know? Yeah. I don't think I've ever skipped through a song on any, any album I've listened to. So. Yeah. Okay. So next question, do you collect anything? <laughs> Uh, you know, probably I collect books. I'm a big book collector. Not, I don't go out and look for the book that's worth $20,000. I collect books. I like to read. So mm -hmm. it's mostly history, you know, historical books, you know, anything Bigfoot, you know, I try to get as many of those as I can. So if I collect anything, I'd probably say books would be what I'd collect. Interesting. I, I go to a lot of different, uh, auctions and sales, you know, I, to me, that's just kind of a passion of mine on the side. Not that I need more junk to try to store in my house, but it is, you know, when you see a cool book, especially an old book, 
um, like to me, like the old Mark Twain stuff, the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer. If I see, even if it's not a first edition, I mean, if I see one that's like a 1940s or 50s type copyright and it is in nice shape, I'll both 10, 15 bucks on just put on my bookshelf. You know, I mean, I love older literature and I really got into for a while. Um, lit- there was a lot of literature that was coming out in the forties and fifties in hardcover books about the outdoors, trapping, hunting. I mean, it, to me, to go back and read some of those, um, approaches they took to these things that today we're talking hex suits and you know thermal spotting scopes and you know but but back then it was just year seven cents and that was it you know i mean there was no uh, well i live in a 400 square foot tiny house so we don't have a whole lot of room to collect anything and the first sure. thing i did after we had the book the house built was build several bookshelves and as many places and put bookshelves in every room <laughs> And they're all full of books. So nice. All right. Let's see. What else did I have on here? Who's the smartest person you ever met? Oh gosh, that's a that's a tough question. I've I've met so many amazing people throughout my law enforcement career. You know, I met tons of people. I got invited to the White House for some of the work I did back in the day for the State Department and the Department of Justice. I was a an instructor and I taught classes literally in, in other countries at international law enforcement academies. And I read, I met some really smart people there. And, you know, I would say recently some of the smartest people that I've met, I would say, and this is somebody that people may not know a ton about, but I'm going to tell you, if you're into Bigfoot and you want to talk to somebody who knows their stuff and their history, talk to Matt Pruitt from the North American Wood Ape Conservancy. If you haven't talked to Matt Pruitt, he is one of the best, smartest, and brightest minds that I frankly have ever met. And I've met wow. people like Jeff Meldrum and other people. Cliff Barackman comes to mind. He's sure. obviously highly intelligent. But when it comes to just overall intelligence, and in addition to that, one of the super nicest people you will ever meet on the face of the earth and most pleasant to have a conversation with is Matt Pruitt. So Matt would probably be in my, my top two or three. Nice. Okay. Uh, what actor would you choose to play you in your biopic? Oh God, that's <laughs> tough. Hey, well, some of my favorite movies of all time have to do with somebody who's actually going through some tough times now and, and had to get out of acting, but Bruce Willis, I'm a huge diehard fan. I grew up on diehard. I can quote every single Die Hard movie from beginning to end, you know. So if anybody, you know, the the badass in me would would say I'd like it to be Tom Cruise or Harrison Ford. You know, I'm a big Harrison Ford as an sure. actor. So interesting. Um, we're at the bar. You've had a few shots. What's your go to karaoke song? You know, it's funny <laughs> that you asked that. I have sang and performed all my life. I've sang in a band, you know, I've recorded an album and I have opened up for some pretty big names in the past and I have never once sang karaoke ever. Mm. But if I were to choose one, it would probably be Garth Brooks, Friends in Low Places. I don't think you can go, you can go wrong with that. Everybody knows that song and would probably sing along and drown me out. So, well, I can, re- I can relate to your reasoning behind uh, the whole, you know, I, I myself was in a band for 16 years and uh, did vocals, played guitar, wrote a lot of music, wrote a lot of music for other bands. And um, I kind of felt like it was like that. Like if I was at the bar, this is before, before I ever got married, if I was at the bar and some girl would say, hey, do you want to dance? It's like even dancing to me felt, I mean, I'll go out and slow dance with you, you know, but I mean, when you're used to playing in a band on a stage, it feels weird being on a dance floor dancing. I know that sounds like that doesn't make sense to most people, but it, there's a dynamic to it. It has nothing to do with pride or anything like that. It's just the comfort, 
comfortability of it just is really awkward, you know? And I kind of feel that way with karaoke too. You know, I, I enjoy listening to great karaoke singers. I think it's a bad science in that one will go up there and suck and everybody in the bar will want to blow their eardrums out with an air compressor and they get done. And it's only going to take one person to tell them great job. And they're going to go fill out five more little slips to sing. I mean, it's just, it, it is, <laughs> but it is interesting. I think asking somebody, what's the, if you were gun your head, you had to sing a song, what would it be? I could see Garth Brooks being your answer. I can see where you'd go that route because that's, hey, you're, the, you're the first person I've ever really had a conversation with that could sort of conceptualize what goes on in my brain when people ask me. I've been asked tons of times to go do karaoke from friends and family. I've got some really good neighbors up the street who love karaoke and I've never been. And I think that's, that's really what it is. It's not a, you know, everybody says, Oh, well, you're too good to do karaoke because you were this big lead singer of these bands. And I'm like, no, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with that. Yeah. I'm just not comfortable doing it, which sounds weird. I've sang in front of 20,000 people, but you put me in a bar with 15 drunks and I don't want to get up on stage and do it. I'm just <laughs> not comfortable yeah. doing that. So no, totally get it. Totally get it. Uh, so here's a, here's a question that Dr. Dean Bertram had on the other night when he had that uh, guest who was the Nashville uh, movie producer, he's Nashville area documentary producer, movie producer. Was what's your favorite paranormal or or uh, sci-fi B movie? Ooh, that's tough. I don't really watch a lot of those kind of movies. I'm more of a, I don't know. God, it's tough. I really don't. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I mean, I guess my favorite paranormal movie of all time would probably be The Exorcist. You know, I like things that are based somewhat in reality and facts. Sure. You know, I've probably seen some really horrible ones. I just don't. None of them really come into mind at this point. For I think for me, Brian, a lot of my favorite shows are the ones that feel like they could happen. You know, some of them are so out there, so many effects. That it's like, dude, come on. But like the conjuring and things like, you know, th like that, you watch this and you feel like this could be happening up the street somewhere. You know, I mean, to me, those actually had more of a scary feel, even though there weren't as many gory effects and stuff in it. But, uh, but yeah, I had uh, Paul Eno on the show gosh, I don't know, probably a year or so back on Sasquatch Odyssey. And he actually worked with Ed and Lorraine Warren early on in their career. And he told me some wild stories about things that he witnessed firsthand that went on during some of their investigations. And that's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in. So those movies are, they, they really are what I enjoy. I mean, it's obviously Hollywood. They're going to embellish, but there's always a little grain of this really happened in some of those movies. And that's what I really enjoy about them. Yeah. What was your favorite subject in school? I would say anything to do with history, social studies, anything history related. I've always been a huge history buff. So if, if something comes out or I see something, I want to know what, where it came from, where, what are the roots? What is, what's the history behind it? I don't read fiction books. I don't, I don't read those kind of things. I like history based, you know, biographies and things like that. So I'd have to say history. Okay. What's the best prank you ever pulled on someone? I'm not a big prankster, but <laughs> I think I've been involved vicariously in a couple, you know, it was always big in the, you know, at least the Atlanta police department where I worked, you know, you have newbies come out, the, the new recruits that get yeah. out. You wait. I was a field training officer. So I had those guys, we had a six month paramilitary Academy. And once you get out of that, then you spend 12 weeks in field training and you rotate. We had six zones. So you'd rotate two weeks in each zone. And when we'd get a new recruit that would come in a brand new sworn in officer and they were in field training, they'd ride with me. You know, we wore dark uniforms. They were really black. So most of the class A's were black. Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite things to do, I normally wouldn't be the one to actually do it. I'd have the other guys go out while we were in roll call and like put baby powder 
in the vents of the patrol car and then turn <laughs> the air or the heat on full blast. And I'd have the recruit go out and say, hey, go start the car and pull it around so we could throw our stuff in it. And then they would come in and they would look like Casper the Friendly Ghost because it had baby powder all over them. So that was one of my favorite things. It's probably <laughs> weird for some people, but if you're a cop, you get it. I think the best prank I ever pulled on anybody, and I think I shared it on my old channel one time, but uh, before I was in real estate, I was in the car business. And eventually I was a general manager at a pretty large Chevy dealership. But pro before that, when I was just in new car sales, I worked at an Audi Volkswagen dealership. It was in 1998 when the new Beetle was released, re-released. And, uh, you know, you would just wait. You couldn't even tell the, the company, you know, you couldn't tell Volkswagen, this is the colors you want. You just got what they gave you, you know. And there was an old gentleman that was in his 60s. Uh, when I say old, because it was way older than me. It was 98 when I was like 29 years old. Um, and he bought a lottery ticket, you know, every, you know, twice a week, every time there was a Powerball drawing. And, uh, we had offices that were kind of like cubicles, um, dividers. And I had to be in one morning way before everybody else showed up at like 7 a.m. because we had a truck showing up with like 10 of these beetles on it. And I'm sitting there and the truck's running a little late. Nobody's there. And I needed a pen. So I walked into his office and I opened his desk drawer. And there was last night's lottery ticket laying there. And so... I quick ran out front and grabbed the paper out of that day's today's paper out of the showroom and looked at it. And it was, you know, there weren't any winning numbers on it, but I quick ran down to the gas station and I bought a lottery ticket today with yesterday's winning numbers on it. And I put it in his desk drawer and laid the paper on his desk. And, uh, he came in and I'm like in my cubicle looking up over the top of it, watching him. <laughs> And he opened that drawer and he looked at the numbers and he put it down and he had this thousand yard stare and he quick looks at it again and looks at the paper and he calls his wife and says, you aren't going to believe this. You aren't going to believe this. And I'm thinking, this is starting to feel like not a great idea. You know, like it, I thought it was going to be so funny, but it's the reality of it starting to hit. So the owner our general manager was always smoking cigars outside. And I walked out there and I said, in a little bit, Don's going to come out and he's probably going to try to quit his job. Don't let him do that. And he says, what did you do? And I told him about the prank and he's just like, Oh my God. And sure enough, he came out and started telling our, our owner, Al started calling him names, telling him how big of a this and that he thought he was, and I'm quitting, and I just went to this whole laundry list of nuclear going off on him. And Al's only words was, before you leave, you better check the date on your lottery ticket. And this guy went into his office and looked and came out and quit. He just quit and left. And I felt horrible. I mean, I... It, I, it just seemed like this is going to be so funny, you know, and it, I felt so horrible about it, but um, I don't, I, I'm a little leery to pull pranks on people after that because who knows where it'll go, but uh, let's see here. Oh, you eat a hot dog. What do you put on it? What condiments? Everybody's got something different. And I think oh. you can tell a lot about a person, Brian, by what they put on a hot dog. Well, that may be scary because I'm like a mustard, slaw, and onions guy. That's all I want on my hot dog. Really? Well, that's quite a bit. I mean, I'm pretty basic. I put ketchup and onions, and that's about it. I mean, I'm not much of a mustard guy. I'm not a definitely not a slaw guy. I, I don't like uh, coleslaw. Uh, and like when we, you guys, I suppose you guys have brats and stuff where you're at, right? Like in the sure. summer, you grill burgers and brats. A lot of people will, will put uh, slaw and brats, and or I can't do that. I actually sometimes just open up a can of sauerkraut, 
just that smell will i'll start dry heaving i i can't stand the smell of it but some people are just go crazy over that stuff but but um i i did like a good chili dog though i can do i i can load up a good chili dog but uh well that's all the questions i had for you so that wasn't too hard um, I'll have to come up with new ones for our ne the next host we have on as a guest. But um, so, what do you got? Uh, we we touched base a little bit before when we were mentioning conferences, and I was l listening to some people talk about some upcoming conferences. Um, that's one of the things I'd like to start talking about. I think on coffee time is what conferences are maybe coming up. It may be the first show of a month. We could talk about what conferences are coming up that month or, or, or whatever, because geographically they're all over the place now. Um, they've kind of gotten cookie cutter in my opinion. It, it, I would love to go to a conference and listen to people speak at them that maybe aren't speaking at the five other conferences that just occurred, you know, but um, it seems like it's always the same rotation of personalities that you see there, which is cool. I mean, a lot of them are well known and it's, I think it's neat for people to be able to meet them in person, so to speak. But um, You have any conferences that you're going to be speaking at here this spring or summer? Well, the only one I'm actually going to be outside of just going and representing the show as a vendor and, and being there to meet and greet people. I, I mentioned the encounter quest. It's the first time they've done this. So it's their first year. They expecting about 1500 to 2000 people. It's in Hamlet, North Carolina. It's up near the coast and it seems like a really cool area. I'm excited to go. I'll be emceeing that next year, but I'll just be there meeting and greeting folks. The only one I'm really going to be participating this year is it's a pretty big one here is the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference up in Gatlinburg, Tennessee in July. I think it's July 22nd or 23rd. And they've asked me, they have an on stage encounters portion where people can actually come up on stage and share their encounters throughout the program, which I thought was really cool. I saw it a couple of years ago for the first time. And the organizer reached out to me and asked me if I would handle that for them this year. So I'm excited to do that. I get on stage and I'll be talking a little bit about the show and sharing some of my personal stuff. And then we'll get into other people's encounters. So sure. I'll be doing that this year. Hopefully I'll get to, I, I want to turn that into an MC gig there. I'd love to MC that. They're going to have, as far as speakers this year confirmed so far, they've got Cliff Barackman, they've got Matt Moneymaker and Renee Holland all from Finding Bigfoot will be there. So pretty decent. I line. think that I think that's a role that you would do real well. Kind of the MC, keep the keep the flow rolling, the party rolling, keep people interested. And it is a neat opportunity to go up between speakers. And you know, if you're running ahead a little bit, uh, got to burn some time. You you've always got stuff to talk about with people's encounter stories. I mean, there's no what do we do for five minutes, you know? So I think that'd be a, an awesome role. I um. I typically will go to one or two conferences a year. I, but I think, I mean, talking to Doug here last month, I think Untold's probably going to put a booth together and start being at a lot of the bigger conferences. You know, we'll put a booth somewhere and, you know, it might be an area where Dr. Dean's at, but, you know, maybe he lives near there. So we'll ship everything to him, have him put up the booth. It'd be cool to have two or three of the hosts at, at you know, figure out which ones we could do where two or three of us could make it to. But, uh, you know, for us, for me and Doug and Alex and, and um, you know, the Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, th that's not hard to, to make work. But, you know, when you start talking about Pennsylvania and New York and Florida and Tennessee, I'd love to go to all those, you know, but there's probably only one or two a year that I'm going to be able to make work really with time restraints and then, you know, just the flat out cost of doing it. But, but yeah, with, I think it would be cool to have an untold vendor area at some of these conferences, just because of hangar one publishing. Many of our hosts have wrote books that could be offered there. Um, we're coming out with merch now for all the new shows for all of our shows. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, the, 
the most enjoyable part of a conference isn't getting up and speaking for 45 minutes, having everybody listen to you. It's the six or eight hours you're going to spend afterwards listening to everybody come up to you and say, let me tell you about my story. Let me tell you what happened to me. I could do that for days in a row. <laughs> I, mean, I really enjoy that. Yeah. It was a great thing about the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Conference. I had been there a couple of times and just taking it all in. And then I went as a vendor last year and there, you know, I talked to Seth Breedlove from Small Town Monsters. Was there. <laughs> His booth was right next to ours. And Seth came up and said that he believed that that conference had grown bigger than the Ohio Bigfoot Conference. I mean, we were in a, I think the vendor space was about 75,000 square feet last year. And it went from 14,000 to like 75,000 square feet for vendors. And then they set up, I think, they were expecting six to 7,000 people. And I think I probably talked to 3,500 to 5,000 of those people that stopped by to talk. And it is that interaction with people and having them tell you their stories. And it's just a really, really cool time. You know, I didn't get to see any of the speakers that were there, but it was Jeff Meldrum was there. I think RPG, I got to hang out with him a little bit. He was the MC last year, but I was stuck at the booth. So I didn't get a whole lot of time to, to actually see the speakers and hear the speakers, but it's a, ton of people that had been on the show already so i'd had mm. sort of a background and, and already got their story but yeah if you get a chance to go to any of the conferences i think you're 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 gonna meet some really cool people and see some really cool things and you know i agree well, i think you. really it's all about the fellowship i mean you know you're trying you, you you look at it and say well it'd be cool to go to one in vegas there's so much to do there it'd be cool to go to one in, in this area i haven't been there before but really what, what the cool aspect of it is just the fellowship and be able to learn from each other, share, share things that are, have happened to you. People are sharing things that have happened to them. And, and in the process, we kind of learn from each other. Um, we're all the students and we're all the, the, the professors, you know, what, what is what it comes down to. There's no college offering a degree in Bigfootometry, you know? So, uh, you know, just that ability to be around people who have had experiences and are willing to share them and talk openly about them, I think is a great dynamic to experience where, wherever the conferences you go to. But Yeah, I definitely what, agree, man. Well, we should probably start circling the, or getting the plane fired up and getting it ready to take off here. Uh We've had about 25 viewers throughout the show. Um, we've gone just over an hour. It's been great talking to you. I always enjoy talking to you, Brian. You're, I, I just think that you're a genuine person. You have a, you're not afraid to share your opinion on things. And um, uh, you, you, you're damn funny. <laughs> I mean, I, I find myself laughing. I think, I think that's a compliment. I'm not sure. Oh, when I see you on somebody else's show, I'll watch. I'm just laughing because you have such a great. Uh, I think a lot of it's just because you don't let yourself get too wrapped up, too serious and stuff. You know. No, There's I so many people. Ago. Life's too short, man. You got to have fun. I get why some people get stuck with that. I mean, it's. Uh, we're talking about a subject that people have a lot of different passionate positions that they're there, whether it's because of an experience, something they've seen, something they've heard, but um, you got to be able to communicate and have, have the conversation without shutting other people down. And I, I mean, I've even seen that in a lot of the big names that are out there, you know, probably a lot of the people you've interviewed on your show over the year, past year is um they just almost feel like they're unapproachable a little bit you know some people are uh they they get big they get to where they can't walk through a grocery store without somebody recognizing them and um you know when i say the coolest part about a conference is that those hours that you spend listening to people say let me tell you about something that happened to me some of those people are hard to approach when it comes to that type of thing. And, and I get it, you know, that they're, maybe they're a little burnt out on the, the, the fame of it, but. Um, yeah. Somebody, you, I wanted, I wanted, I'm glad you said that. I wanted to address something that somebody said in the chat a little while ago, and it was about Cliff Brackman. I, I think it was Judy. I don't know if she had a personal experience with Cliff or not, but said something about, he didn't seem very nice. I'm going to tell you something behind the scenes. And I've interviewed a lot of people. And Cliff was the most generous, 
and kind person on and off during the interview. That's my personal experience with him. I know that people have been put off by his personality in the past because he seems I've heard the word condescending and know it all and that kind of thing. That's just his personality. He has a very funny sense of humor and he was nothing but kind and professional. And like I said, at the end of the interview, he offered to help in any way he possibly could. And he's just passionate about the subject. I think I went over like 15 minutes. He, he kind of had a hard out because he was at work at the, the Bigfoot center there in Oregon. And we had set an hour and we went about 15 minutes over. And after it was over, I said, I'm so sorry. I apologize. He was like, dude, you know, I love this. I get to talk about Bigfoot. That's my job. And he was perfectly laid back and cool. So if anybody has not had a personal experience with Cliff, I hope that comes through in the interview that he is just, at least in my experience, one of the nicest people I've ever interviewed. So I've, I, you know, I get where some people draw that opinion because it, it I'll see one interview where it, it does feel like that. And then you see another interview with him. You're like, dude, I can hang out and have a beer with this guy. You know, I mean, I think depending on what they're talking about, that guy has so much going on in his head when it comes to experiences and things he's seen and things he's heard and people he's talked to. I mean, I, it's, I think it's hard for him to have a conversation and be able to say, Hey, I'm going to take a moment here and breathe a little bit and laugh about it and this and that. Some of these interview styles that people do with him are just question after question after, what's your opinion on this? What's your opinion on that? What's your opinion on this? And you are going to come off as condescending when you are hammered with questions like that. Yeah, Um, we got into things. Unfortunately. Yeah, he opened up, which I'd never heard him talk about before. He opened up about his his late mother and father's opinions on him being in the Sasquatch community and his time on finding Bigfoot and just other things that I felt was a very vulnerable state for him. And I'd never heard him open up like that. And it was sort of this side of him that I had never seen on television or in other podcast interviews or anything like that. So I, I thought it was a great interview. You know, like I said, you guys can check it out over the next couple of weeks. I'll, I'll it'll air here in the next probably two to three weeks. So, I think the uh, if I had a choice, you know, if you're talking Bobo, Cliff, Matt, or Renee, who would you want to interview? A lot of people are surprised when I say I think I'd want to interview Renee, and and, and my reasoning is this: um, I've seen a hundred interviews with the other three. Um, a lot of them are a little bit cookie cutter. If I was ever interviewed Cliff Brackman or Bobo, I would have to, I would ask some questions that they haven't been asked before. And I'm not talking about put them on the spot, try to get controversy. I'm just talking about the style of things that I'm going to ask them aren't going to be the same thing, the same canned, require the same canned response that they've come acclimated to give over and over. Renee would probably be the one I'd want to interview the most one because she's from where I grew up in South Dakota, kind of crazy how she got involved in the show. She does come with a a bit of a skeptical approach. Um, And I think, I think it would be a fun, intriguing interview and not just the, why don't you believe this? Why don't you think that? I mean, those are the, why would you ask somebody those types of questions? I mean, Google their name and look at the last five interviews they've done. You want to ask the same thing. Is that really the point here? So yeah, it's funny you mentioned that she's been on my short list and I've got that interview in the works, hopefully. So I really want to get her on the show and do exactly what you're talking about, because I don't think I've ever heard her on a podcast. She doesn't do a ton of, as far as I know, she may have only done one other conference outside of the Smoky Mountain Conference that's coming up yeah. this year. Like she doesn't do the circuit. She doesn't get on those kind of shows. And there's not a ton of information out there really outside of what you might catch, you know, from a tweet or something that she said on the show or whatnot. So I'm definitely uh, trying to, my goal is to get her and moneymaker on the show before the the conference in July. So we'll see. Over the past year, um, well, I should say the past four or five months, six months, I'd been communicating with Rob Lowe's wife. Um, And I know that you had mentioned that you were thinking about getting Rob Lowe on a show. This is something I've been working on for a long time. Um, 
And the reason why I wanted to interview him is I didn't want to ask him the same questions. Everybody. I mean, yeah, I'd love to hear about the haunted prison in Idaho and things like that. To me, the story is um, him and his son, who at the time was like 17 years old, sitting in a truck going state to state to state, looking at these things, seeing your son taking an interest in some of these things that you have an interest in, seeing him develop a comfortability in front of a camera. I mean, as the dad of a 17 and 18 year old boys, I, to me, the interview would be about half of what his shows covered. The other half would be the dynamic of tell me what it was like with your kid. Tell me how you felt that bond grew stronger and what, you know, what did you guys find yourselves doing when you weren't in front of a camera? You know, uh, who, who decided where you went out to eat that night? You know, things like that. To me, that would be the interview. That's what would make it feel, people would watch that and say, man, I feel like I know Rob Lowe right now. You know, it's just not the same questions over and over. Um, and, that you know, when I look at a hit list of who I'd want to get on, I mean, I'd, I'd love to have Josh Gates on. Uh, there's one episode in particular, the Romanian forest terror, whatever, that I would love to talk to him about and find out what that was like. Didn't have a lot to do with him. It had to do with somebody that was on his crew that had an, th this thing experienced. It happened right in front of him, but it, it's not the typical interview somebody's going to give with Josh Gates, you know? Um but yeah, Doug asked me a long time ago, he says, who would your wish list be of guests? And I told him, and as I'm going through the names, he says, oh yeah, we can get them. Oh yeah, we could get those. <laughs> and I'm like, like you have their contact? He's, oh yeah. <laughs> you know? So, but uh, we're really in the process of growing untold radio. I mean, where we started six months ago, where we were at three months ago and where we're at now. Um, it's not just the subs on YouTube. I mean, there's like 2,300 plus subs here now, which aren't a ton yet, but for something that's as young as it is, it's interesting how fast it, it's grown listenership and viewership wise. The podcast platforms blow me away that we have, you know, uh, 80,000 listens in a month, you know, I mean, it's like, whoa, <laughs> it's way more than what we have here on YouTube. But when you consider who are these guests you'd want to get on, I've been kind of trying to wait till we hit that, you know, I think the rate we went from a couple hundred to 2000, we'll probably get from 2300 to, you know, six or 8,000 probably in the next, you know, four to six months. I mean, it, it should grow at that rate. Um, and then when we get to that point, maybe I'd get some of the, the bigger names on my hit list on, but uh, I, I've i really gotten into the whole finding these guests that are out in the field doing research that are maybe not in these areas that everybody's talking about. You know, they're, they're not in the green swamp. They're not in Texas or Oklahoma. They're in Wisconsin. They're in Minnesota. They're, you know, I think these guys are interesting. Um, it's a niche that I, when I search them online, it doesn't seem like they've done a hundred interviews before, you know? So how do you, when it comes to weird encounters, do you, is this your opportunity to look at the different things that you've done over the Sasquatch, the paranormal, the true crime stuff uh, o o over the last year and say, let's take the most intriguing, the in most interesting and bring them on weird encounters. Or are you constantly real time searching for who would be a good guest for this? It's usually a real time search for me. You know, I kind of do the same thing. If something comes up on my radar or somebody that I think is interesting, or there's been people that I've wanted to get on for a while that, you know, kind of fit the bill for weird encounters I try to do it that way, you know, like this, the Daryl Sims interview that's coming up here, I'm doing it in about an hour or so, you know, not a ton of people are going to enjoy that on the Sasquatch Odyssey side. They're really not into the alien abductions and alien implant stuff, but the people that are into weirder stuff and weirder encounters will probably enjoy the Daryl 
Sims interview. I think he's an interesting character, you know, his, his background in the CIA and military police officer and some of the things he's done in the past, I think is for me as a former law enforcement officer is kind of interesting because he takes a different approach to investigations. And of course, like everybody, he's, he's not immune to controversy in some of the things that he said. So I'm looking forward to that conversation in particular, because anybody that makes claims about alien implants and knowing the different types of aliens and things like that, that I've heard him say in the past, I, I have some questions that, you know, some people may not ask him, you know, I'm not going to do you that. Know, I, I think I mentioned that on a show the other day, you know, I'm not, I don't find it hard to stand outside at 2 AM and look up at the sky and say that this would be unlikely for us to be the only intelligent life that could possibly figure out how to travel, you know, like that. But I, you know, how you would break that down into grays and this, and these are meaner than those. And then I, I don't, I, I, I'm not versed in, I don't watch a lot of people talk about that stuff. It kind of scrambles my brain a little bit, although I do find it intriguing, but, um, well, most of that comes from investigations. You know, it's, they talk to people and people have these encounters and they, they describe them in detail. So that's a Nordic. That's a person that looks like us. And then there's the greys and then there's the praying mantis. And then there's all these different types of aliens that people report. So, and I think they just do very much like Bigfoot. They, they put that data I think, together. I, I think that's how you have to relate it is if they, it, you, know, you take somebody from that community or that corner of the room of the paranormal and you talk about Bigfoot and it's something that they're not really familiar with. They don't watch Bigfoot shows. They don't, they're probably listening to that conversation going, why are they different heights? Why do some of them have long hair and short hair? Why, why, you know, there's as many questions that exist for them about Sasquatch as there are for those of us who are standing in this corner of the room, looking at all these other areas of the paranormal. So. Absolutely. But, so Joe says, uh, my 18 year old son is the same age as I was. And Jay Fritz was, uh, when we had our encounters, it's turned out maybe, you know, it's interesting because my son was, uh, he's a senior in high school. My oldest son, my youngest son is a junior, but my oldest one applied to and was accepted at Montana state university out in Bozeman, which is pretty rough country. I mean, it, it could, you can get, go not too far from college campus and be off the grid pretty well there. Um, so he's excited about that. He wants to get a degree in criminal justice, and he wants to start a career and build a career with the U.S. Marshals. So um, perhaps, Joe, he'll have that opportunity going to college in Bozeman. I think back when I was in college, man, that would have been a dream to go to, some, go to school someplace like that. But, but uh, appreciate everybody for joining us in chat, for asking the questions. We've been trying to keep up with the conversation. Um, See you guys tonight. Uh, Pine Island Research, like I said, I've got Chuck Morgan on, the Howling Underdog Films. Uh, Brian will have a show coming up Friday night on Weird Encounters. What time is that on Friday, Brian? It varies. It's pre-recorded, so most of them drop early afternoon. Okay, okay. Well, they can just, uh, you know, if, you, if, you, if you've subbed, you'll get the notifications and uh, you can check that out when it drops, so. I appreciate you coming on, joining us for coffee time. Like I say, we're still kind of finding our flow here. It's a new show. This is our second episode. But um, I, I was, uh, Doug says, who are you going to have? I had Doug on first, and he says, who are you going to have on first, so to speak? And I said, I'm going to have Brian on because I know we can have a great conversation. And it'll be fun. So, But uh, every week we'll have somebody different from the network, a different host on. Um, and we'll get to know them just like we got to know Brian today. So appreciate your time. Yeah, man. I had a blast. It's always good to talk to you. All right, buddy. Well, let's get this outro going and we will see you later, Brian.